Hello, my name is Stacey Dice. Um, today we'll be talking about um, honing your techniques in harm reduction and motivational interviewing. Um, let's get started. So just to let you know, uh, this program is wholly funded in part by the government of the District of Columbia, um, Department of Health, HIV AIDS, Hepatitis STI TB Administration, HASTA. So what we're going to do today is we're going to define what risk reduction is and how it applies to HIV prevention. Um, we're going to talk about client, patient, constituent, guest, whichever one you call them, centered harm and risk reduction practices. Um, we're going to learn what motivational interviewing is, and we're going to gain a few skills to practice motivational interviewing. And you'll get a better idea of what we mean when we say practice um, as we get further into the PowerPoint. So I want you to take just a few seconds to think about what you think about when you hear the word harm reduction. Here's how we define it in public health. It's a range of policies designed to reduce harmful consequences associated with human behaviors, both legal and illegal. Um, so we know that policies are used to manage behaviors such as recreational drug usage and sexual activities and numerous settings. So this is just the, the working definition that we are gonna work with today um, when we're, we're referring to harm reduction. So the principles of harm reduction overall is uh, to be participant centered. So meet individuals where they are, however they come in, right? So it doesn't matter if they disclose to you that they never use condoms, it's okay. We're gonna talk about that. Meet them where they are. Um, participant um, involvement, involvement and autonomy. So the patient, client, constituent, guest, they are the experts of their lives. So we are, in the moment that we have with them, we allow them to be in control of the appointment because they're coming to us for services, right? And they will be making these decisions for themselves. Um, also recognizing inequalities and injustices. Um, just knowing what folks are, are facing, the realities of poverty, class, racism, social isolation, past trauma, sex-based discrimination. There are many things that your folks are walking into your offices with that you just need to recognize, right? Um, as well as being practical and realistic. So it's not realistic to tell somebody to stop doing something all of a sudden. Think of yourself and trying to change a habit that you've had for years that you would like to change and how many times it took you and um, how difficult it was. We have to be realistic in where people are at, their, at, um, at the current time that they're with us and how, what kind of changes they can make. How realistic are they and how practical are they? And it also encompasses uh, continuum behavior. So from the worst to the best from heavy drug use to total abstinence, um, from um, consistent barrier use to no barrier use. It's a continuum that we're talking about, but we're, the idea is to get our clients, patients, constituents on a healthier spectrum of the continuum, no matter how that happens. So again, another question, and if we were live action, this would be a point of discussion, but since we're not, I want you to take a second to think about what harm reduction strategies do you know of for HIV prevention? And we're gonna talk about a few of them. So tech, harm reduction techniques for sexual health are everything that you probably thought of and more, right? So routine HIV testing, know your status campaigns, STI testing, the usage of barriers, latex, polyurethane, or polyisoprene, and we'll talk a little bit more about what those are. Uh, Serial adapt adaptation, and we'll talk about that as well. Treatment as prevention, um, post-exposure prophylactic, prophylactics, PEP, and PrEP, pre-exposure prophylactics. Some newer uh, interventions, newer techniques that we have at our disposal that are amazing and work and that should be wider spread. So this is just a few of the campaigns that you all in DC have to offer, which I thought was awesome because it was just easy to search. Um, and we're talking about um, our, our, our passive messaging, right? So we're talking about our flyers, we're talking about um, ads on the bus stop, we're talking about 
YouTube, you all in DC have a bunch of campaigns at your disposal, which are awesome and use real people and gets and continues to get the word out, right? So just a few of the things for you to take a look at that you all have. And I know this is not even um, all of it because I had to, I didn't have enough space on the slides. So this is, these are the things, these are a few things that um, I thought were great to see. Also, we talk about barriers um, and we're talking not exclusively, but we're going to talk about external versus internal condoms. So the, the condoms that we know of as formerly known as, as male and female, and we use external internal um, to be more inclusive of who is using them, right? It doesn't matter how, it doesn't matter who is using them or how, as long as they are. So we already know um, about the external male condom, the one that's the most prevalent. And again, if we were live action, this would be a game um, that everyone participate in. Um, the condom, the condom lineup game. What I, what we also want not to leave out of this conversation is condom negotiation and having a conversation about negotiating condom usage prior to our clients, patients, constituents, and even ourselves engaging in sexual activity. Because that's a, a, a definitely an important step before um, we actually engage or use or put on. Um, in sexual activity with condoms, right? It's just an important, important piece of the, of the, the puzzle. Um, however, we also know that there are some folks who do not have that luxury of negotiating condom usage. So in as much as we are talking about um, using external condoms, there are many methods we could talk about to our clients on how to use them if you are unable to have the discussion, if you're engaging in, in, in sex work. Um, it is an important thing to keep yourself safe. You can also use cheeking, putting the condom on with your mouth. You can also use the internal condom, aka the female condom. Um, and we refer to it as the internal condom because it's not always used for vaginas, right? It can also be used for anal sex. Um, so the, one of the great things about the female condom is or the internal condom is that folks can put them in hours in advance, right? So up to six hours in advance, a, an internal condom can be inserted and still used. Um, so it's a, a, um, it's a tool in folks' ar arsenal to protect themselves that we have to be aware of and educate our clients, patients, constituents, guests about. So when we're talking about harm reduction regarding to sexual health, we're talking about consisting in correct condom use with all partners. So it's important for folks to know how to use a condom properly. Um, and it's important for us to know how to use condoms properly so we can tell them, so we can show them, so we can share with them. Um, so also condom and bear use with new or one-time sex partners. Consistent condom use for uh, birth control if that is um, a priority. Seroadaptation, what we were talking about earlier, so we consist of sero sorting, so choosing your partners based on their HIV SCI status or sero positioning, choosing sexual position um, in order based on status as well, so insert of over receptive, aka top or bottom, um, just choosing your position to reduce your risk. Um, also, there's the tried and true pull out method, right? Um, not which is, we know is not 100% safe uh, because there is pre-ejaculates that are teeming with virus and bacteria um, when we're having, when we're engaging in sex that we have to be aware of as well. However, the pull-up method has kind of worked in some instances um, so that you are reducing your risk, right? We're not talking necessarily about eliminating in some of these instances, but things that we can do to re reduce our risk um, to transmitting HIV and, uh, and or an other SCIs are what we're talking about today. And then we also have biomedical HIV prevention. So we have our treatment as prevention. We have our PrEP, we have our PEP. So let's talk a little bit about biomedical prevention. So we're talking about PrEP. Um, so we have come to realize through studies and uh, pharma pharmaceutical assistance um, from, uh, and I'm not going to say by who, however, 
we know that Truvada and Descovy are the only two drugs that are currently approved by the FDA for PrEP. Um, and PrEP involves a person who is HIV negative taking um, antiretroviral medications, PrEP, Truvada, or Descovy, um, to reduce their risk of HIV exposure, right? So this pill is taken once a day, every day, consistently, um, and it is known to have reduced risk of transmitting HIV 92 to 99% in folks engaging in, um, in sexual activity and 70% for those engaging in injection drug usage. Um, so again, right now we know that Truvada only could be used for heterosexual men and women, bisexual, gay, transgender, transgender individuals, um, as well as inject those who engage in injection drug use and pregnant women. However, we know that Descovy is not necessarily the same. Um, and not to hop on my soapbox, but we know for a fact that Descovy is only for use in um, men who have sex with men, cisgender men, and trans women. Um, it is not recommended for, um, for those who engage in vaginal sex. Uh, for also important to let your clients, constituents, patients know that prep for anal sex, a person needs to be on prep for seven days of Truvada before enough of the drug is on board um, for protective immunity. Um, so seven days for those engaging in anal sex. It is not the morning after pill. You can't take it. You can't take it um, just one time the day before and expect it to be on board. You need seven days of consistent pill, consistent pill usage before it's on board. But for vaginal sex, and this is a bit of a disparity, however, the studies have shown that this is what is needed. For vaginal sex, it takes 21 days to build up protective immunity um, in the vagina for those who are engaging, engaging in vaginal sex. Um, so again, important keys in your arsenal of, of risk reduction to know are the for anal sex, it takes seven days to be on board um, for protection in the rectum. And for vaginal sex, it takes 21 days for protective immunity in the vagina. Um, we also know through studies that adherence, and adherence to any kind of medication therapy is key, right? So one pill every day. Then we have PEP. And we've known PEP in the past um, as an emergency, uh, an, an occupational um, exposure emergency drug, right? Someone has accidentally um, been needle sick or engaged with some kind of exposure and they go to their provider and they get PEP. Um, and PEP involves taking antiretrovirals within 72 hours of exposure before the virus has, a time, has time to, um, to replicate. Right, so PIP, PEP consists of, it could be one pill, it could be two pills, but it's two to three antiretroviral medications taken for 28 days consistently in order to um, prevent someone who's, who's been um, accidentally exposed from getting or developing HIV. Um, the catch is we also have, at the moment, there are few areas who will pre prescribe PrEP prep for not only for occupational exposure, but in cases of sexual assault and rape. Um, there is not quite yet uh, very many entities that give PEP on demand, right? You've had an accident and you need to go on PEP. There are a few that find their way around that, but it's not 100% um, covered by insurances yet. We're, we're working on it. Because again, it's an important tool in our arsenal for harm reduction, right? That we need to be able to tell folks, okay, so this happened today, but you have 72 hours in which to take this drug that will prevent you, that will hopefully prevent you from getting HIV. So let's talk about prevention, um, uh, treatment as prevention. We've known for years in the, uh, the HIV infectious disease community that those with undetectable viral loads are a very um, are pretty much have no transmission risk to their partners. But it was proven and it was 
it was actually studied many times, as a matter of fact. Um, the study that I'm referring to right now is the partner study, 20, 2016, where 1,000 mixed sero couples, so one, pa one partner was positive, the other was negative, um, engaged in sex, unprotected sex, about 58,000 times. They had a lot of sex, y'all. Um, they had a lot of sex, but the part that we want to pay attention to, there were zero transmissions of HIV as a result of those um, 1,000 couples having unprotected sex with their partner. So the caveat is these, these um, the partners, the positive partners, maintained an undetectable viral load, which is the key, right? We, as we tell all of our people living with HIV AIDS, we want your CD4 count to be as high as possible and your viral load to be undetectable. These of the, 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 in the serial mixed couples in these studies, these individuals were um, undetectable, viral load undetectable, and engaged in sex with their negative partners, resulting in, in zero transmissions. Again, we've known about this in the HIV community for a long time, right? But this study has proven that we need folks to um, get into treatment early and hard. So treat aggressively and treat immediately, which we have actually done a really good job of lately. So we say all that to say, undetectable is untransmittable. The U, equal U, U equals U campaign, which again, we've known for years. So a person living with HIV who has been undetectable, who is undetectable, has virtually um, no risk of transmission to their partners, as long as they maintain an un undetectable status. So, go back a little bit. Um, just to round that off, when we're talking about harm reduction um, and sexuality health, these are just a few of the tools that we have that um, we can use when we're talking to folks about HIV SCI prevention, right? So, these are just a few things that we're going to, we're actually going to come back and, and talk about how we use them in a little bit. But we're moving on to another form of harm reduction. So, traditionally, we know harm reduction. Um, or the phrase harm reduction in regards to drug usage, right? So we, we, we have, um, we have this language um, that transcends, public health wise for us in public health transcends. So it's not just for sex, it's also for drug usage and for other behaviors that um, illegal or legal that folks are trying to change. So we're talking in regards to drug usage, treating folks with respect and dis dis um, dignity is foremost the first tenet that we want to pay attention to. But we have in our arsenal uh, syringe service programs, medication assisted treatment. Um, we have our, our Good Samaritan policies that help us on the legal side of things. Right, um, we have access to fentanyl um, testing strips, which is important in um, in our our risk reduction practices now, given the epidemic that we have um, regarding um, overdoses and our heroin epidemic, our opioid epidemic. It's um, opioid and um, got more words all twisted. <laughs> our opioid epidemic at the moment. We have mobile services, peer support insurance navigation. Um, we are talking about folks helping guide folks to recovery, pursuing recovery, and we're going to be talking about overdose pre pre prevention as well. So this slide uh, shows us the importance of understanding opportunities for transmission and contamination um, when we are talking about injection drug usage. And I should have given a trigger warning, and I do apologize. Um, but the, these are the modes, there are certain, there are, are modes that um, in this particular photo, excuse me, we, there are several ways that folk that are uh, of contamination that folks can either transmit HIV or hepatitis mostly, right? Um, so we're talking about the mixing water, we're talking about your cooker, we're talking about your cotton or your filter. So these are modes of transmission that folks sometimes don't think about. So if we're talking about when um, staunching the blood after the injection, 
We're talking about the needle itself, because let's remember that live blood can stay alive for 48 hours within the cannula or the, the, um, the hole of a needle, because it's a vacuum, right? There's no air in there. And live blood can stay live, which means that if you are sharing needles, that's a mode of transmission um, that we know of um, was the highest, excuse me, the highest um, in um, how folks were transmitting HIV in the past. Um, so we know that all of these, all of these, um, these modes here that we see could be possibly um, be modes of transmission. But then we also forget about the other drugs when we're not injecting. We're talking about mouthpieces and pipes, right? Um, mouthpieces are put on the end of a pipe. It could be made, sometimes they're made of metal or glass. We're talking about um, creating openings on the lip through burns or cuts or cracks. And of course, we know that HIV and all of our other uh, STIs need a place to enter the body, right? So mouths with cracked, um, your cracked lips and sores on your lips, blisters on your lips and, and in your mouth are easy pathways of transmission um, and of, of hepatitis C, um, HIV and other bloodborne pathogens. So just some things that we need to be aware of as well. So let's talk about our SSPs. Um, so we know of SSPs uh, as being um, our needle exchange program, but they're not just needle exchange programs, which is, which is awesome. So we have seen SSPs evolve um, into multi-service programs, right? So they have testing, they have vaccinations, um, folks can get um, overdose treatment as well as ed education. It's a place to safely dispose of needles and you get your free needles in your works, right? There are some programs in which you have to trade, trade your old works for new works, but either way, it's a place for folks who are engaging in, in um, injection drug usage to get clean works and clean needles, which is the point we have seen in um, our, um, our high endemic areas. So in Baltimore and DC, we've seen the rates of HIV change, right? It used to, injection drug usage used to be one of the highest modes, modes of transition. However, with the onset of our syringe services programs, we've seen those numbers plummet, right? Which is the key, which is awesome to see, which is exactly what we want to happen. So by being able to provide syringe service programs to folks, it's a way to reduce transmission and get folks the support they need as well. Because um, we also know that testing is involved. So if we're talking about HIV and we're talking about STIs, it's a place for folks to get tested and possibly get referrals, get treated. So there's some programs that you can get treated right then and there. And there are other programs that have referrals for folks to get treated. But the point is that we have somewhat of a wraparound service in which folks can get providers, I mean, can get services, right? Not just needles, but also assistance with getting referrals to medical care and other supportive services. So we know syringe exchange programs save lives and prevent HIV. So these are all the tools that uh, some of our, our friends and family who are working in SSPs are exchanging and giving our, uh, our folks, our guests, um, to help them reduce their risk of getting HIV, right? So also we talk about the Good Samaritan Law. So the Good Samaritan Overdose Pre Prevention Amendment Act of 2012 for DC pretty much says that if you are helping someone in an overdose situation and you are caught with small amounts of illegal drugs or paraphernalia, they will not persecute you, right? This is what they, this is what this law says to us. Um, we also, it also protects minors um, in this case. Um, and it also gives protection against criminal charges. Um, if they are providing services to someone. It also, because this was not always the case, it also uh, decriminalizes the possession of naloxone. And we know naloxone is an important tool in our, um, in our arsenal of preventing overdose, right? We know that um, 
naloxone in the DC metro area, as well as in Baltimore, but the uh, Baltimore metro metropolitan area, naloxone is given by most health departments and can be received. You can get it at any pers any um, any drugstore with no prescription. Um, so again, it's another arsenal, another weapon in our arsenal. I have mine in my car. I have a kit in my car and I have a kit in my bag, just in case. So we're talking about overdose prevention that I just mentioned. So naloxone um, is one of the drugs of choice that we use that is a um, overdose reversal drug. Um, it is it is easily used these days. It has changed. It's evolved some, but we know that pharmacists may um, dispense naloxone to anyone in the District of Columbia. So how do we put all this to work? Because we talked a lot uh, about harm reduction. Now we're going to talk about how we're going to use it um, and who we're going to use it with, and we're going to talk about how we um, encourage our clients, patients, guests to use these harm reduction methods that we were talking about. So we do know just a little setup for motivational interviewing. We know that a lot of um, what we refer to as recovery and um, um, recovery, we'll say recovery, a lot of what we refer to recovery is based on the stages of change or the trans theoretical model of behavior change um, by Dr. DiComente and Prochaska. We know that there are six stages of it. We know that it is not linear, it is definitely cyclical because we can go back and forth between stages of change, right? Um, so that we know that everyone goes through stages of change. I want you guys to think for a moment about a habit that you've tried to kick that you have been working on or you have successfully completed, right? You went from not considering it to thinking about, oh, maybe I should change this thing. I can use myself an example, sugar. We know that sugar is the demon in the closet for everyone. It is the boogeyman. And I set out to um, eliminate sugar from my diet, which was extremely hard as you all can imagine. So I went from thinking about, I don't need to change. I don't, I, don't, I don't need to stop drinking sugar too. Oh, my doctor says that there's some things going on. Maybe I should consider it. To preparing, getting rid of all the sugar stuff in my house, right? I prepared for this thing. I'm like, all right, I'm going to do it into action and actually doing it, replacing sugar with other things or not at all. Um, and then maintenance. So I'm at that maintenance stage where I pretty much kicked the habit. Yay for me. Um, I have definitely had a relapse once or twice and had to go back and do this thing all over again. But I'm, 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 I'm kind of sticking with it. And you will see that and with your patients, clients, constituents, guests, that you can sometimes see folks going through these models of change by, um, um, at our very, in our, in, with, when we're with them. Like sometimes we can see them going through all six of them in their mind while, they're, while we're working with them. But our goal is to help them get to a healthy place with this change, right? To move from one, one to the next or move back, however, whatever direction that they need to. Um, so this chart shows some strat strategies that we employ with patients, clients, constituents at different readiness, different stages of their readiness to change. Um, so we can look at the first two, um, pre-contemplation and what we would, ooh, going back, um, pre-contemplation, we can offer factual information. Sometimes that's all that's needing. We can explore the meaning of events that brought them to treatment. So what brought you in today? Let's talk about it. Um, explore the pros and cons of targeted behaviors. So which behaviors you're talking about. So we could, it could range from using condoms to reducing usage of injection, um, um, injectable drugs, right? Um, so this chart and everyone will get a copy of the PowerPoint so they can have this at their disposal because again, it's about um, increasing your arsenal, right? It's about giving you tools to work with your clients, patients, constituents, and um, this is one of them. 
So just, it offers you um, strategies, right? It offers you some strategies that you can employ. And we're going to talk about even more strategies. We continue to talk about uh, motivational interviewing. So this is the, the definition that we're working with. Um, with motivational interviewing. Um, it refers to a collaborative approach to the practitioner, patient, client, constituent relationship, right? So motivational interviewing is a person-centered, evidence-based, which means that the client is wherever they, however they come in, whenever they come in, um, they are the experts of their lives. Um, evidence-based, it means that this thing was studied and then studied again, and there's evidence that it works. Goal-oriented method for um, enhancing intrinsic motivation, so the motivation, um, the motivation of the client themselves um, to change by exploring and resolving ambivalence within the, the individual. And ambivalence meaning, ambivalence meaning the patient's experience of conflicting thoughts feelings and behaviors about change. So exploring those, what are their, what are the, what are the almost, I, I, almost barriers, like what are the barriers or what are your ifs and whens versus changed or not to change, right? The practitioner's job in this, um, in this whole thing is to listen for and evoke the patient's reason or concern for change, right? Um, but there are a lot of other things that go with that, which we are going to go ahead and talk about. So we know that motivation is not static. So it doesn't stay still. It is not a, a, um, a tangible thing that just sits. It's not a rock. Um, but it changes from day to day. I want you to think about yourself and what motivates you daily. Um, getting up some mornings and you're feeling excited about going to work and then other mornings, you're not so excited to get up and go to work, right? Your motivation changes. Um, it's sometimes day to day, sometimes minute to minute, sometimes hour to hour, but it can be influenced, enhanced, and um, elicited by you, the practitioner, towards your client. Um, so we know that motivation is something that one does. Not something that you necessarily have, but it's something that you do. It's a, a static moving action. Um, it's the key to change. Uh, it fluctuates, as we said, it changes minute to minute, and it can be influenced. And we're, today we're talking about how you, the practitioner, can influence your clients, patients, constituents, guests to change, right? It could also be modified. modified. It could be changed, it could be rounded, it could be shaped, it could be sharpened. Um, and you, the clinician, the job of you, the clinician, um, is to elicit and enhance motivation. You are um, you are helping to increase that motivation, to hone that motivation with your client, not necessarily for your client. So we know that motivational interviewing, we know that it's, it's, it's fluid, right? Back and forth, up and down. Um, and we know that it's influenced in the context of your relationship with your client patient constituent. Um, sometimes in the minute of that encounter. Um, so your task is to work with ambivalence and resistance, right? What are the ifs and buts of your client and what are the barriers? How are they, what is the resistance and how can you work through that resistance with them, right? Your goal is to influence change with your client, patient, constituent in the direction of health. So MI is a strength-based approach um, opposed to, uh, as opposed, excuse me, to weakness-based. So it seeks to build on patient intrinsic, the patient's intrinsic ability. Um, it, oh, sorry, had lost my, my, um, my PowerPoint. Um, it, we are building on their strengths. We're building on their motivation. We're building on their intrinsic abilities. So we know that uh, motivational interviewing affirms, emphasizes, supports, and encourages our patients, clients, constituents. Um, it's individualized and client-centered. So again, however they come, whenever they come, um, it is um, we, 
need to be clients, client, patient, constituent, guest centered whenever they come into our presence, right? Um, as well as be flexible about it. Um, it creates therapeutic partnerships. We talked about relationship building. So the idea is for you and your client patient, patient constituent to create um, an active partnership where the client and counselor or client and um, nurse or client and provider, whichever you refer yourself as, work together to, to establish goals and strategies. Um, it uses empathy and not authority, right? Um, so we know positive outcomes are always related to empathy and warm and supportive listening. So the shift of MI um, motivational interviewing is that it places the impetus for change directly on the patient. It's not on you, the practitioner, your job is to support the patient in reaching their own conclusions about change, right? So it is our job to elicit and support change, not to force nor demand it. So we have, again, just giving you some tools for your arsenal, your little bag of tricks. Um, we have some tools that we're gonna talk about working with today. Um, Darned Cat, because we love our, uh, our, our mnemonic, mnemonic devices. We'll be talking about Darned Cat, we'll be talking about ORs, and we'll be talking about ears. So the first one is Darn Cat. Darn Cat talks about types of change talk that you should be listening for with your client patient constituent. So Darn Cat, D, desire. I want to, I wish. Ability, I would, I could. Reason, there are good reasons too. This is important because I need of course, need to, commitment, I intend to, I plan to. Activation, I'm doing this today. Um, taking steps, I went to my first group or I went or I walked past where I usually get my drugs from, right? So we know um, that when you are talking to your clients, patient constituents, with the, the time that you have with them, you're listening for darned, that darned cat desirability, reason, need, commitment, activation, and taking steps. But then you want to elicit change talk. So you want to um, change talk is patient speech that favors the movement in the direction of change. So using the ORS approach gives the patient the opportunity to talk themselves into considering making behavior changes because the idea is to get them to make those changes, not for you to make those changes for them. So we have ORs. Uh, using your attending skills, you're asking open-ended questions, giving them the opportunity. Your who, what, where's, and why's are always, well, not necessarily why, and we'll talk about that later, maybe, but your who's, where's, and what's, um, asking your open-ended questions. You are affirming them, right? You're affirming their, uh, their ideas, you are forming, affirming their decision to make this change and encouraging them. You're reflective listening. So you heard what they said and you're gonna reflect back what they said to you. Um, you're gonna summarize to make sure that you got everything all wrapped up. And this is how we talk, we elicit change talk. We get folks to a point where they are talking about change. But then we have our ears our elaborating. So this is responding to change talk. This is how we respond. So ears reminds you to elaborate by asking for more detail, affirm by making a positive commitment, reflect what the patient says, and summarize the patient's comment. We do have a few other tools for MI. Um, reflection, altering, rephrasing when you're, when you're um, summarizing or when you're reflecting altering slightly, um, alter and amplify, add intensity or value to what your patient is saying, double-sided, so you're reflecting their ambivalence, their ifs and buts, so they can see them, they can hear them, and they can come to, a, um, they can come to their own conclusions regarding their own ambivalence, right? Um, metaphor, creating a picture, shifting the focus, so change the focus of what they said to something that, um, something more positive that they can see, right? 
reframing, offering a new meaning to something. Um, paradoxical sometimes, which is a slippery slope, but sometimes it does work. So siding with the negative to see, so the patient can, can see and hear um, the other side of what they're saying as well. And then emphasize personal choice. It is indeed up to you. You are the expert of your life. So how do we use motivational interviewing for harm reduction? We are using, um, we're gonna presume that there are things present, right? So we know, uh, we, I said it earlier, that folks are walking into your office and your spaces um, with their own set of issues, their own country, cultural view. Um, so we're going to presume that they have stuff and baggage with them, right? So the idea for us is to identify and challenge generalizations, um, get clear um, about frustration, uncertainty, fear, um, accept what folks are coming in with, because uh, accept folks how they're coming in, like I said, being client-centered, um, and we are moving forward in forging, oh, I keep doing that. Apologies, everyone. Uh, forging the therapeutic alliance. So again, meeting them where they are, even if they're actively using. You may have a patient client constituents coming to your office, hi, or drunk, right? Deal with them, work with them, wherever they come to your, whatever stage they come to your office. Because the fact of the matter is, they are actually coming in and they didn't have to, right? So meet them where they are, um, assess the risk. You have to continuously assess, assess the risk of what's going on in your, uh, your, your relationship, excuse me, or you're working with the patient. Affirming their ambivalence. So welcome the part of them that does not want to change. Right? Again, we're gonna, I want you to think back to yourself and in your process of trying to change a habit or, um, or action and embrace that part that doesn't want to change because that part will sabotage the healthier efforts, right? Also, setting positive change goals. So affirm what the patient client constituents feel that they can take on. So if they say, all right, all right, all right, I can use condoms three times out of my 20 encounters this week. Affirm that. That is a positive change. You're like, all right, let's have a party for that. Let's get you some condoms so that we can help you, um, help you with that goal, right? And help you um, with that positive change that you're taking to the next, react, um, next, next step. And then encourage them. All right, so this week we're gonna go with three. How about we try for five the week after, right? So the idea is to empower them to be in the driver's seat for their own change process, creating a personalized vision around their ideal usage and a game plan to get there because that is what you're there for. And you're there to help them create that goal, encourage that goal, and give them the tools to actually work with and meet the goals that they're setting for themselves. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we call this part the advice sandwich and that little sweetie pie, she is not mine, um, but she was so cute that I couldn't help it. So the advice sandwich is ask permission. So you're getting permission. And sometimes getting permission is just the fact that they're coming into your office and taking a seat with you. Um, giving advice, and it's not necessarily advice in the traditional sense that we understand it, um, and then asking for a response. So what do you think of this? this is, are you ready to work with this? How can I help you work with this? So we're gonna move on from the cutie pie. Everyone take a last look. Oh, she's so cute, she is. Asking permission. So what now? What do you think you'll do? Um, so this is where we talk about what happens next for your patients. So what do you think you do? Um, where, what do you see as your options? Where would we go from here? What's gonna happen next? Then we give advice. So we ask a patient about previous successes sometimes that they've had with making a difficult train. So what has helped you in the past, right? You want to use these questions to, to, to start the conversation. Um, you are highlighting your past successes and you're making suggestions about how they can use those strengths that they've used in the past 
to also help them with this current change. Um, so you're asking, what personal strengths allowed you to do it? Um, have you made any other kinds of changes successfully in the past? So the idea is to help the patient build their confidence that they are capable of making healthy changes because they've done so in the past, right? So we are encouraging them to move forth with their own strengths. Because again, this is a strength-based um, conversation method um, way of interacting with our clients, patients, constituents. Um, also, to to um, offer up a, a, a menu, right? So the goal is to generate acceptable options towards change and then help them select the one that they are willing to try, right? So you can help them by offering this menu or you can elicit um, ideas. So what do you think of um, doing this? So what do you think of managing your drinking use? So cutting down, so instead of having 20, 20 shots today. How about you think of having 10, right? Or, or maybe even 15. So you're, you are reducing risk by cutting down because the, the ultimate goal is, goal is to get them to a healthier point, right? However, whatever that looks like, however, whatever that means. So sometimes by providing concrete examples of what folks can do to reduce their risk, um, you you help them in one, maintaining the fact that they have a choice in this thing, right? They have a choice in whether or not they want to, they're ready to change, uh, a choice in how to change and what to change as well. So, um, and going back to our sandwich, we, um, excuse me, <clears throat> without giving advice, because the idea is not for us to necessarily give advice, like here's what you should do. No, that's not necessarily what we're talking about in this, this instance, but we are using our tools. So we did our, we, uh, we heard what folks had to say, we've listed change, um, and now we're helping them figure out how and where they want to share and change. So our job, what we can do is provide clear information, because sometimes it's really a matter of what uh, what information a patient needs. Sometimes they need a couple facts, right? So they need to know, I can, you will always have condoms at, their, at your availability for them, right? Sometimes they need to know that you will always have the calendar for the, the, the syringe exchange program and you'll know where they're going to be at any given day, right? Um, you can also, you can also use third person. So what happens to some people is that this works for some folks. I have heard that. You can say, my recommendation would be, and you can say it directly, my recommendation would be, if it feels, if condoms are uncomfortable, let's try a different brand, or let's try a different, different, um, different kind of, of condom. Maybe we'll use an external. Maybe we'll use an internal. Maybe we'll change the size. Maybe we'll change the material. Okay, so it sounds like you might have a slight latex, latex um, um, sensitivity, Let's look into polyisoprene. Um, lube, offering lube. Why don't we try lube? Maybe that'll make you feel better. You know, so recommendations as well. Elicit your reaction. What do you think about that? What are your thoughts in regards to um, what we just discussed and what I, what I just suggested? Um, but also give them room for to disagree. You always want to get feedback because it allows the patient client constituent to feel in control and to feel that they are smart enough to figure it out because they are, right? They are smart enough because they are the experts of their own lives. They are smart enough to figure out what is gonna work for them tomorrow when they leave your office with these new ideas, with this new motivation, with these new tools that you provided them, right? So the idea is to make sure that they, they um, know that they are in control and know that they can make the best decisions for themselves. So as we close the conversation with our clients, um, you want to summarize their views, especially the positive, right? Summarizing them encourages them to share what additional views that they have and repeating whatever argument was, was uh, reached during the discussion about options. 
Um, sometimes it's, it's also helpful for, to have them write it down, right? Sometimes seeing something on paper helps you remember it better or, or helps you absorb that information. Um, what they've articulated themselves as a way of setting up a kind of contract with themselves to follow through, right? So we're summarizing the views, we're in encouraging them to share their views. And what was reached, so we repeated. So it's helpful to, it's like, um, it's like a, a memory game that you repeat. You wanna repeat what agreement was reached. Uh, repeat with them or have them repeat what their goals are. So some tips for you, um, the provider. When you don't know, say you don't know. We are in the age of Google, and guess what? If you don't know, you can look it up, but it's totally okay for you to say so. It's all right to say, you know what? I am not sure about this. Let me check. I will look it up and get back to you. Um, celebrate small wins. Sometimes it's the small things that make the difference. And, and these time, this age and time, every win is important right every positive change towards health is important so celebrate those small wins with them do roll with the punches you are not going to be able to work with everyone what is important is that your patients clients constituents guests know that you are there to work with them when they're ready right so don't be discouraged just roll with the punches because you're not going to win them all right? And do set limits. Set limits for yourself to keep yourself sane, your staff sane, your, your patients, clients, constituents sane. Because again, you're not going to win everything and it is useless to keep um, doing the same thing if it's not going to work. Sometimes take a breather, set your limits, set a time limit, set a place limit, set your limits um, so that you can keep yourself sane. Do keep your humor. Um, I think the funny part to me about public health is public health professions, we have an interesting, interesting type of humor. Um, we have seen and heard and done a lot of things. And there's some things that we realize are funny that can be in a, totally inappropriate. However, keep your sense of humor. If it makes you laugh, laugh. It is okay. Learn from your mistakes. You are not perfect. So I'm going to say that again. We are not perfect. And it's okay to make mistakes because that's the only way that we're going to learn. Don't beat yourself up about it. Learn from your mistake and keep it moving. Um, and do take care of yourself. You are the only person you have. You're the only you you have, right? If you can, you cannot continue to pour, just, just to, to, to quote an old cliche, you can't continue to pour from an empty cup. So if there's nothing fulfilling you, you're not going to have enough to share with the clients who need what you have to share because you are important as a practitioner provider. You are there to, we're, we're there essentially to save the world, right? But you can't save the world if you don't have the energy to do so. So do take care of yourself. Do relax. Do decompose. Do talk to your fellow providers. Um, because they are your greatest allies. You all do the same thing, right? You know, you've heard the stories. Everyone's got a, a story of, of, um, of, of humor, of tragedy, of frustration. Share with your coworkers. They are, will be your best allies. But overall, do take care of yourself. You're the only you you have. And people need you. We need you, right? So, um, in conclusion, I do have some, uh, some citations. So you know that I did some research, y'all. There's a lot of research that went into all this information that I've shared with you. Um, on many of the slides, there are references already there, and these are some additional citations. Um, and then we will, I will be here for questions. Whatever questions you have, I'll be here to listen and, um, and answer for you. So thank you. Um, thank you for listening to me drone on. I hope I was not too boring. I hope you got something from this, most importantly. Um, and when we come to question time, let me know what practices will you change as a result of what we talked about today um, and what you're taking from it. 
So again, thanks for listening and I will see you live. Have a good day.